ABC News exclusive, the officer from Ferguson, Missouri, who will not be charged in the shooting death of Michael Brown, speaking out for the first time. Darren Wilson with our George Stephanopoulos today, revealing what he says happened while in that patrol car, the struggle. He describes the moment he first pulls the trigger and then what he says plays out when he gets out of that car. A country watched what played out overnight in Ferguson, buildings, cars set on fire. And today, the aftermath, the charred cars, some of the buildings, piles of ash. And tonight, a nation now hears from the officer at the center of this case. Let's get right to George, who's just back from Ferguson tonight. And George, you were telling me you sat down with him for an hour and a half, nothing off the table here. He answered every question, and we went step by step through those fateful moments on August 9th. He said he saw Michael Brown walking down the middle of the street on the yellow line. He asked him to move over. Brown didn't, so the officer pulled his car behind him. This is what happened next. I had gone to open the door and get out of the car. And when I did so, I, as I was opening the door, I said, hey, come here for a minute. And that's when he turned and said, what the f are you going to do about it? And slammed my door shut on me. Slam the door shut? Yes. I used my door to try and push him back and yell at him to get back. And again, he just pushed the door shut and just stares at me. And as I look back at him, all of a sudden, punches start flying. He, he threw the first punch? Yes. He threw the first one and hit me in the uh, left side of my face. Because, you know, some of the witnesses have said that they saw you trying to pull him into the car. That would be against every training I ever taught to any law enforcement officer. I don't know what or how many hit me after that. I just know there was a barrage of swinging and grabbing and pulling for about 10 seconds. And then what? I had reached out my window of my right hand to grab onto his forearm because I was going to try and move him back and get out of the car to where I'm no longer trapped. And when I felt it, I just felt the immense power that he had. I mean, the way I've described it is it was like a five-year-old holding on to Hulk Hogan. That's just how big this man was. Hulk Hogan? He was very large. Very powerful man. You're a pretty big guy. Yeah, I'm above average. So you try to grab him, but you feel that force. Yes. And then as I'm holding him, I see him coming back around with his left hand. And it's in the shape like this, and it comes in through the window and just a solid punch to the right side of my face. But you're still sitting there figuring out, how do I get out of this? Yes. I mean, the next thing was, how do I survive? Because I didn't know how if do I you could... survive? Yes, I didn't know if I'd be able to withstand another hit like that. Where's your gun at that point? I keep it on my right hip. Mm -hmm. I take it out, and I come up, I point it at him. And when I said I said, get back, or I'm going to shoot you. And then his response, immediately, he grabbed the top of my gun. And when he grabbed it, he said, you're too much of a to shoot me. All right, now, here's a photograph of Darren Wilson's firearm. Okay. And as you can see, it's a Sig Sawyer. Looks to be a 40 caliber. And... Um, of course, it's a semi-automatic. Okay, so keep this in mind when he talks about the fact that um, Michael grabbed the top of his gun. He's going to go on to tell some more about the story, so keep that in mind. And while he's doing that, I can feel his hand trying to come over my hand and get inside the trigger guard and try and shoot me with my own gun. And that's when I pulled the trigger for the first time. What happened? didn't go off. Okay, you see, it's Michael Brown grabbed the top of his gun and tried to get inside the, the trigger guard to shoot him with his own gun. And then Wilson said that this is when he uh, pulled the trigger for the first time and that the gun didn't go off. Okay, now we're going to hear some more of his story. Watch this. The gun was actually being jammed by his hand on top of the firearm. So I tried again and again another click. And this time I'm like, this, this has to work, otherwise I'm, you know, I'm going to be. Okay, right here he says that the gun was jammed by Michael Brown's hand being on top of the gun. Now, have you ever known a police officer not to already have a round already in the chamber? The picture on your screen depicts a Sig Sawyer in the recoil position, right? So... When you fire around the uh, top part of the, the carrier, I think it's called, uh, uh, shoots to the rear, like the position that you're looking at on your screen, and then it comes forward, and when it comes forward, another round is uh, inserted into the chamber, right? So then after that's done, the gun is ready to shoot, and then all you have to do is pull the trigger. Right, so keep that in mind. So if there's a round already in the chamber of a semi-automatic gun, 
then when you pull the trigger, the gun is going to go off. Okay? So, the situation is, how is it possible for Michael Brown to push the carriage to the rear to the point where the uh, Sig Sawyer won't fire? I don't think that's uh, possible. I think if Mike Brown was pushing back on the carrier at all, then uh, Dan Wilson would move his hand in that same direction, eliminating that pressure or eliminating the possibility of him jamming the gun, and then he's able to fire the gun. But I don't think that the gun just clicked at all is what I'm saying. I think the gun went off as soon as he pulled the trigger. Dead. He's going to get this gun away from me. He, something's going to happen, and I'm going to be dead. So I pull a third time, and it finally goes off. That was the first time you'd ever used your gun, right? Yes, it was. In all your years as a police officer? Yes. And then what happens? He gets even angrier. His aggression, his face, the intensity just increases. And he comes back in at me again. I wasn't looking at him. I was just like, racket, expecting another hit, and I put my gun up and fired. Now, right here, he said he put his gun up and fired. He didn't say the gun misfired. He said he put his gun up and fired, right? Now, everybody that knows anything about a semi-automatic firearm knows that once you pull the trigger and it clicks, the gun has got to be cocked again before it will fire. Now, he didn't say anything about pulling the hammer back and then firing the gun. He said he just pulled the trigger again and it fired. That's what he said, right? Now remember, this guy plainly described what Mike Brown's fist looked like as it was coming toward his face. I mean, how, how many people can do that? Can determine how somebody's fist is looking as it's coming toward their face. Now take a look at this photograph. Now this photograph looks like, at best, somebody may have pinched him. But according to him, this is how his face looked after Mike Brown punched him in it with uh, with closed knuckles, and this is how his face look. I mean, he's just he's just pink, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's pink anyway. You know, most people call him white, but he's not white. You know, that ruler next to his face is white. His face is basically pink, right? So now he got slapped in the face maybe right before they took this photograph. And then they put a, a glove on whoever took the photograph to make him look like he probably a doctor. But he probably walked right in there right before they took the photograph and had somebody pinch him on the face or something. Then he want to per perpetrate like this is what his face looked like after he got punched in the face by this man that he claimed is as strong as Hulk, Hulk, Hulk Hogan. Imagine that. Then I go to exit my car. And when I'm getting out, I use my walkie and I say, shots fired, send more cars. And I start chasing after Michael Brown. Why not stay in the car? He's running away. Because he's not, my job isn't to just sit and wait. You know, I have to see where this guy goes. So you felt it was your duty to give chase? It, yes, it was. That's, I mean, that's what we were trained to do. And he, run, he runs out of the car, gets about 30 or 40 feet. You can now get out of the car. Mm -hmm. You start to follow him. And then he stops? He does stop. Why? When he stopped, he turned and faced me. And as he does that, his right hand immediately goes into his waistband. And his left hand is a fist. You know, no wonder people got so upset after they heard this testimony. Most of it sounded like bullshit. You know, he's telling the story like everybody is a complete bumbling idiot and, and can't see through the falsehoods that he's trying to strangely mix with some form of the truth. What that could be, I don't have the slightest idea, but this one appears to be simply a blatant liar. At his side, and he starts charging me. What did you think when you saw that? I didn't know, I mean, my initial thought was, is there a weapon in there? Even right. though he hadn't pulled something out earlier when he was confronting you. Yeah, it was still just the unknown. And again All right, right here, proof, evidence, and confirmation that this son of a bitch is a liar. Most of the time when somebody's lying, they're either going to look away or they're going to close their eyes or somehow or another they're not going to want you to see their soul or their spirit. So therefore, they look away or they close their eyes.
Here's that proof and confirmation right here. Again, we're taught, taught to let me see your hands. As you know, some of the eyewitnesses have said when at that moment when he turned around, he turned around and put his hands up. That would be incorrect. Incorrect. No way. That would be incorrect. He can't even talk straight. You know, the, the troopers got him so shook till he can't even speak it. See what I'm saying? He can't even speak a, a, a common word correctly. Uncorrect. Then he changed it to incorrect. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uncorrect what you're saying, man, because it's a lie. No way. So you say he starts to run, does a stutter step, starts to come towards you, mm -hmm. and? At that time, I gave myself another mental check. You know, can I shoot this guy? You know, can't, legally, can I? And the question I answered myself was, I have to. If I don't, he will kill me if he gets to me. Now, you mean to tell me this cat, or I should say this human, has already shot Mike Brown several times. Then he's going to do a mental check and ask himself, can he legally shoot the man? It's too late to be asking yourself that. You shot him several times already. Even though he's, what, 35, 40 feet, feet away? Once he's coming that direction, why, if he hasn't stopped yet, when's he going to stop? After he's coming at me and I decide to shoot, I fired a series of shots and paused. What did you see? I noticed at least one of them hit him. I don't know where, but I saw his body kind of just flinch a little. And after that, I paused and I again yelled, you know, stop, get on the ground, giving him the opportunity to stop. And he ignored all the commands and he just kept running. And so after he kept running again, I shot another series of shots. And at least now right here he says he commanded Mike Brown to stop, get on the ground. And Mike Brown kept running. He didn't say Mike Brown kept charging him. He said Mike Brown kept running, right? And so that means that if Mike Brown is running, then he's running to get away from his crazy ass. So this cat is admitting to shooting Mike Brown in the back or attempting to. It's one of those hit him because I saw the flinch. Well, this time he's about 15 feet away. So I start backpedaling because he's just getting too close and he's still not stopping. He gets to about eight to 10 feet. And as he does that, he kind of starts to lean forward like he's gonna tackle me. And I looked down my barrel of my gun and I fired and what I saw was his head and that's where it went. Right in the top of his head? Yes. You'd never even shot your gun before and now a man is dead. Mm -hmm. After the supervisor got there, I gave him the brief rundown of what had happened. What'd you tell him? I told him that I had to shoot somebody. And he asked me why. I said, well, he had grabbed my gun and he had charged me and he was going to kill me. So you killed him first? Yes. Is there anything you could have done differently that would have prevented that killing from taking place? No. Nothing? No. And you're absolutely convinced when you look through your heart and your mind that if Michael Brown were white, this would have gone down in exactly the same way? Yes. No question? No question. You and your wife, I don't even know, know if this word is appropriate anymore, what is your dream going forward? Like I said, we just want to have a normal life. That's it. I guess it's hard to have a normal life after someone is lying dead. Mm -hmm. Something you think that will always haunt you? I don't think it's a haunting. It's always going to be something that happened. No, there's no haunting or there's no uh, regrets or bad feelings about the whole thing. In other words, it don't mean nothing to him. He don't have no, uh, no consciousness and no spirit and no uh, compassion for another being because you don't have a soul. That's what happens when ones don't have a soul. They have no consciousness and no regrets and they go and they sleep at night as if nothing ever happened. You, are, you, you have a very clean conscience. The reason I have a clean conscience because I know I did my job right. In fact, he said it was the first time he shot his gun. And George, did he have a message for the family of Michael Brown? He spoke to them directly. He said, I'm sorry that their son lost his life. He knows there's nothing he can say that's going to make them feel better. But he also said again and again and again, you saw that right there, there's nothing he says he would do differently right now. You know, the main problem I got with all of this is all of the destructive activity that these melanin-dominant people are participating in. 
uh, the destruction and the burning and the violence and so forth and so on. And I think they don't get the lesson. See, the lesson is the same as it was back in the time when King was killed, back during the time when all of these other ones was killed, Malcolm and all the rest of them that was killed by Europeans who murdered their, their, uh, their loved ones. And it's been going on since the history of the European being on this land. Nothing is different, nothing is gonna change, and ones don't get the lesson. So if you don't remember history, then history is doomed to repeat itself. What these ones don't seem to re realize is that the system is benefiting from all of this violence and all this burning. I mean, when you burn down a store, Walgreens or Kmart or whatever you burning down, car dealerships, they got insurance. They gonna collect off the insurance. Matter of fact, they might have been doing bad business and not making no money and wish the place would burn down. Matter of fact, they may have even burned the places down themselves and blamed it on them ones, see. So you ain't doing nothing but helping the system. One night, 61 people got arrested. So what's gonna happen after they get arrested? They gonna take them to jail. They gonna charge them. They gonna fine them. They might even keep them in jail all the time. They, they benefit from your anguish. See what I'm saying? They benefiting from your violence. You're not helping yourself at all by participating in that type of activity. You know, get with the sheep, and I can tell you what it is that you need to do. Oh, my God.